Hey, morning guys. Welcome to the folks on the live stream across the U.S. Welcome to the folks in the room here. We're going to talk about time this morning. Time is your most valuable resource. And when you think about waking up on a day of planning, you look out the window and you see this, you look at the forecast and you're thinking, man, I'm not even sure if I can get an 80 in today. Because you're thinking about everything you got to get done. You're thinking about the planter running in the field. You're thinking about, did the tillage get done? Thinking about, did the weed and feed get on? Thinking about getting the tender in the right spot. It's all about managing time. Time. It drives us. It also drives performance of the seed in the furrow. Think about it. We've got seed in the furrow, one next to another. And that seed, the time that it takes to take in moisture at a certain temperature, to start germinating, and eventually to emerge, is absolutely critical. We've got to manage time. So, again, good morning. My name's Dale Cook. I am a product manager here in the research and development department here at Precision Planning. Um, so if you, if you hear a little bit of engineer coming out, that's just natural. I apologize for that. But I'll be joined in a little bit by Doug from our North American sales team. He's one of our leads uh, for North America. We are going to talk about managing the furrow in the field. We're going to talk about it in, in four steps, in four different pillars. I'm really going to focus on the seed, and Doug's going to branch out from that. So when we look at our goal. Our goal is uniform, consistent, speedy emergence. We want to minimize competition. We want to level competition among our plants. Because we know if one plant emerges 24, 48, 72 hours behind its neighbor, that that plant is always going to be competing for the sunlight that its neighbor is already harvesting above it. That plant is always going to be a runt. And you're, you will see, and I'm sure you have seen, that as the season goes on, that plant only gets farther and farther behind. So what drove it home for me was a study I did back, I think it was 2015. It was when we were just starting the Smart Depth Project. So it was a depth plot out back. And what we did in one of those treatments is we flagged out as the plants were emerging. We flagged them out the day that they emerged. We went out every day first day, second day, third day as plants were coming out. And we then at harvest time hand weighed the ears and this is what we saw. At day one we'd already lost 3%. So the first day after the, after the first plants emerged we'd already lost 3%. By the time we got to day two we'd lost 13%. By the time we got to days four and five we'd lost 37% compared to the first emerged plants. It makes a difference. And this was corn, and we talk about corn a lot here in, in the Midwest. But as you think about your fields, you might be from the south and you've got some cotton in there. You might be from up north. We've got folks from Fargo joining us on the simulcast. You've got beets and sunflowers up there. None of you, regardless of your crop, would let me come to your field on Monday and say, you know what, I'm in kind of a hurry I'm out of seed. I can only get 16,000 seeds per acre in your field, even though you want 32,000. I'm going to come back on Wednesday. I got enough seed to plant the other 16,000. I'm going to, I'm going to sprinkle that in amongst the, the crop that was planted on Monday. You're saying, no way. That's crazy, right? You don't want to set up an unfair competition between those seeds, regardless of the crop that you're in. So it matters. Uniform emergence. I'm going to be focusing on what the seed experiences. We're going to talk about moisture, temperature, residue, all critical factors to manage when it comes to uniform emergence. So let's dive into it. Let's think about moisture. I like thinking about moisture as gas in the tank. In the same way that you guys fueled up before you came to Tremont or before you went to Fargo, before you went to Ames, wherever you're at, same way that you fueled up, your engine wouldn't run without fuel. A seed's engine won't run without the fuel of water. All the biological processes need water to get fired up. That's what takes it out of dormancy. 
That's what allows the cells to start elongating, dividing, growing. Eventually, the coleoptile breaks through the pericarp, and germination has happened. This is the point of no return. Germination is the point at which you can't rewind this clock. You can't put the seed back in the bag. That seed is either going to thrive or it's going to fail. So let's dive into moisture some more. The way we think about moisture at Precision is maybe a little bit different than, than the rest of, of the industry. We think about it from the seed's point of view. And the seed's point of view depends on the type of soil it's in. So just as a demonstration, I've got three different types of soil over here, or I should say three different years of soil that we collected for the Smart Firmer Project over 2016. We got the white buckets, 2017, the blue buckets, 2018, the green buckets. So this is just a sample of our soil library. And what we did is we brought all that soil in-house from our testing across the country. And we said, we have got to understand, we've got to understand how the seed interacts with all these different kinds of soil. So we'd take that soil, we'd spread it out on a tray, we'd scan it with a spectrometer. So a spectrometer essentially measures how well light reflects off of the soil. We'd correlate those readings back to measurements that are useful, like the organic matter, like moisture, like, like we also scan residue, of course. It has a very different look to a spectrometer compared to the rest of the soil. So we did that because we wanted to understand then when we germinated seeds in those different types of soil and those different levels of moisture, what did it look like? So for each of those soils, we germinated seeds. And this is just one demonstration of that to really make this point. We've got a here, as an example, a clay and a sand. So we've got a fine textured and a coarse textured soil. We then put three similar amounts of water in each of those soils. So 2.5% water, 5% water, and 7.5% water. We then took 10 seeds for this demonstration and we germinated those 10 seeds in those two soils. We germinated them for three days, okay? And what did we see? Only one actually germinated. 5% water in the sand. And actually, I'd argue only a majority of those seeds germinated. What happened? What happened in the clay? It had the same amount of water. What happened? That clay has a lot more attachment sites than the sand has. The water hides in the clay. The clay pulls the water. It doesn't give it to the seed. The sand, on the other hand, it can't hold on to that water. It's given all of its water to the seed. In fact, when you look at it, what happened at 7.5% water in the sand? We drowned it out. Right? We took all the oxygen out of its environment. We need warmth, moisture, oxygen to germinate seed. We drowned it out at 7.5%. Now, we know, like you guys heard in the last session on Smart Depth, we know it takes 30% of the seed's weight and moisture to start the germination process. And you can see, here's these weights after three days. In the sand, 27%. 51% gain, 57% gain. So at 2.5%, we weren't quite there. But we'd actually pushed over and gotten too far at 7.5% in the sand. In the clay, we hardly even got halfway there. So how do we report this then on the 2020? So this is how it would look. The way we'd report this is we'd give you a green box at 51%. That exceeds the 30% goal. But we put it yellow on both ends, a little bit too dry at 27, a little bit too wet at 57. Of course, if you were farther than that, like we saw here in the clay, we'd make that red. It's like, this is way too dry. We can't recommend planting in this, in this sort of environment. So that's how we think about moisture, is from the seed's point of view, from how much weight we predict it's going to take up in three days. So how does Smart Firmer measure soil moisture, measure these things? Well, what it is, 
that little rectangular clear window you see in the, in the bottom right there, out of that window we're shining different wavelengths of light, five different wavelengths of light. And we're measuring what percentage of that light comes back to us. So in the same way that we did it in the soil lab, we're doing that in the field as well. And we correlate that back to things that matter. Moisture, organic matter, residue, uniform furrow, these things. So that's how Smart Firmer works. I now want to switch gears. And I'm going to switch. I want to, I want to talk about questions that we have gotten over the past year as guys have been running Smart Firmer, questions that we have gotten about how do I interpret these results? What do I do? Okay? So we're going to start with moisture. First question. I'm already at two and a half inches deep and Smart Firmer says I don't have enough moisture. Can this be right? That's a valid question. Maybe you've never planted deeper than two and a half inches. Can that be right? Well, I got one principle, one principle to think about here, and that is Smart Firmer doesn't have an opinion. The guy on your left, the gal on your right has an opinion. Smart Firmer doesn't care. It doesn't care if you're having a bad day or a good day. It's going to report what it sees. Grandpa who's digging, your grandson who's digging have an opinion. Smart Firmer doesn't care. So it's going to sock it to you. It's going to tell you even if it's a painful truth. Right? I'd rather have a painful truth. I'd rather have someone tell me the truth, even if it hurts, rather than somebody to pat me on the back and say, you're doing a great job, keep it up, even though in actuality, this thing's a mess. Wouldn't you? So let's think about some considerations about should I go deeper? Or how do I manage a furrow that's, that's saying that it's dry, smart firmer saying that it's dry? These really fall into two categories, short-term, long-term. Okay, in the short-term, we're going to start with the easy one. Any guesses? Go deeper. Have you ever tried planting at two and three quarters? You ever tried planting at three inches? You know, I'd personally rather plant in a furrow environment where I know I got the right moisture than one that's a comfortable depth without enough moisture. Try going deeper. Now, I get there's a, there's a practical limit to this. If, if you look like this guy, and you're digging your seed, you've got to put your hand on the side of the furrow to reach down and dig your seed, you've gone a little bit too deep, right? So <laughs> there's a practical limit to this, but try it out. Try going a quarter. Try going a half deeper than what you've done before. Number two, if you're still puzzled about it, it's like, why... Why is it saying I'm dry? Well, what else could be going on? Do we have soil collapsing from the top of the furrow? Do we have loose gauge wheels that aren't, that aren't tight against the openers and those loose gauge wheels are getting dry top soil caught between them and a rooster tail in that soil into the furrow? I challenge you to, to walk behind the planter, maybe chain up a closing system or lift one up for about 50 foot. We do this all the time when we're troubleshooting things, and, and look at that open furrow and try to figure out what's going on. Sit on a row unit, or even you can lay on a row unit if you want to. You know, here's Mike. He's, he's really getting into it uh, as he's trying to figure out what's going on in that test. So try to understand that. The second really falls into long-term bucket. So this is, this is really about changing up your tillage program, changing up your practices, do you have a moisture blocker in your soil profile? Do you have a significant density change that is preventing the moisture from coming up at the nighttime? Right? What happens at night? The sun goes on the other side of the world, the wind sometimes dies down, and that moisture just comes right up to the surface. But do you have some sort of density change, some sort of layer that's preventing that moisture from coming up? Ask yourself that. You run in your field cultivator four inches deep, and you got a nice smeared pan right there, keeping that moisture from coming up. What else? What about the timing of your tillage? Timing matters. Hopefully you guys are paying attention to this. If it's hot and dry and windy, you better be chasing that, you better be chasing that soil finisher pretty quick. 
better be pretty quick on its heels. If you're cooler, if you're, if you're not as windy, you've got a little bit of buffer there. And that buffer can sometimes be helpful to help things, help the soil profile even out a little bit. But let's watch that. Another question on moisture. Smart firmer shows my fields have good furrow moisture. Can this be right? Well, I'd say first of all, celebrate, pat yourself on the back, do some high fives. You did a good job. You did something right in terms of timing your tillage, in terms of uh, you know, getting your soil profile set right, and also just by the blessings of the good Lord. He evidently blessed you with timely rains. But I would challenge you to dig deeper into this. Let's say, let's pretend your low row is more down like below 30%. Let's say we're at 25%. I challenge you to understand what's going on there. What's going on? Is that because that's the row that's always been running behind my tractor tire and the disc openers are worn down on that row and I've actually shallowed a little bit up and that's why that row's dry? Ask yourself the whys. Why am I seeing what I'm seeing? Because when you ask yourself why, when you ask each other why, you're going to take your knowledge to the next level. The more inquisitive you become, the more answers you seek to the problems, to the inconsistencies, the better an operator you're going to be. Ask that. Ask yourself why. This says most of my fields have good furrow moisture. I'd ask you, I'd challenge you, for the fields that don't, what's going on? Is that just how you've been blessed with rain events over the planting season? Or is there something deeper going on with that specific field? Is that a field that you just rented this year, and there's a density layer, there's something going on in that soil profile that's keeping the moisture from coming up to the seed zone? What's going on there? You know, I think about furrow moisture and that measurement is really like a set of steel toe boots. You know, you guys lace up your boots in the morning, not because you're planning to drop a tractor weight on your toe, but you lace them up for that odd occasion, for the occasion where somebody else drops something on your toe, or where you just make an accident. You're not paying attention, you're in a hurry. I think the same thing is true when it comes to managing furrow moisture. You guys are good operators. You're paying attention to moisture, but you're also human. And you're especially human when it's late at night, when you've been running for 20 hours straight, and you're maybe getting a little bit sloppy and you're not digging or you're digging by flashlight, and you're not paying as close attention as you should be about where you're at. Smart Firmer is there to protect you. Protect you for those sorts of oopses, those sorts of accidents. Let's talk about temperature. Now, temperature can be a little bit of a contentious topic. Maybe not as much down in the, in the southern states, but certainly as you get into the Midwest and the northern Midwest, um, we all have our opinions about when we should or shouldn't be planning. So we'll try to keep this as objective as possible. But temperature matters. You know, maybe around here in the central Midwest, we get one out of every four seasons where we don't even hardly think about soil temperature. We get a nice warming trend, only warm rains, and we just go, go, go. But a lot of seasons, we're wrestling with this scenario. We're trying to avoid this scenario where we're worried because the seed's energy reserves might be exhausted. If we start germination underground, the seed is expending energy for every second it spends underground and it's started germination. It is expending its energy stores. And we don't want to expend that prematurely before we get to the surface and start photosynthesizing. We're also trying to avoid a chilling injury, which is different. This is what happens when the seed takes in water that's too cold and we swell the cells and actually those cell walls rupture and we end up deforming the seed we end up messing up the, the, the inner workings of the seed, and we get things like corkscrewed mesocotyls. And ultimately, that seed is not going to perform as it ought to because it had water that was too cold. Those cells are too stiff. Just like if you ask me to go play a football game right now, you know what I'm going to do before I, before I do that? 
go out there to the field, I'm going to stretch. The seed needs to limber up too, and it needs warm enough, warm enough moisture to limber up its cell walls. I think about temperature as the throttle. If moisture is fuel in the tank, temperature is what makes everything happen faster. Just to drive that one home. So here's a plot. This shows days to emerge on the vertical axis. On the bottom, we show temperature. And this was just, this test was done at a single temperature, so all the way from 50 to 75. And what you can see is not a straight curve, but it's an it's a exponential, exponential increase in days to emerge as you get colder. Temperature matters. Now, you're going to hear me say that there's no easy answers to this. It all depends on your scenario and the constraints that you're bound by, whether it's your soil conditions, where you've just, you've got to get in before this rain, otherwise you're going to be out for the next three weeks. I get it. I understand that. I understand that there's trade-offs we have to make. But certainly, temperature matters. The way we measure temperature on Smart Firmer is that little gray oval you see there is actually a thermal pile sensor. So what we're doing is, you know, Everything around you, including the person next to you, is emitting thermal radiation at a certain wavelength. We take a sensor that's sensitive at that wavelength and we measure that thermal radiation. We convert that to a temperature and that tells us, that tells us what we're at in the furrow. So that's how, we, that's how we measure that. Let's ask some questions now. Again, these are questions that we've gotten. Smart Firmer shows my soil temps dipping below 50 what should I do? Now, you folks in Fargo, you may be saying, I'm always below 50, or I'm barely above 50. Some of you might be saying, I'm, I'm never planting below 50. How do we think about this? Here's some data. And this is data. I'm just going to share with you, and I want, you to, I want you to take it and think about it. What do we got here? It'll take me a little bit to explain this, so stick with me. What we got on the vertical axis is hours to emergence. Now, what this was is they started the clock when 10% of the crop was emerged. They stopped the clock when 90% of the clock was when 90% of the crop was emerged. So the middle 80%, the window is the middle 80%. What they saw at these temperatures. The low end, they cycled the temp from 50 to 68, so simulating a nighttime to daytime temperature cycle. On the right, they cycled it from 59 to 77, simulating a warmer night to day temperature cycle. And what do you see? Well, when you put the numbers to it, going from a 59 average temp down to a 68 average temp improved our emergence window by 47 hours. We went from 68 hours to emerge that crop to 21 hours, 47 hours difference. Temperature matters, not just in time to emerge, but in uniformity of emergence. How different is the soil temp at inch and a half compared to two and a half inches? Does this affect germination? Good question. Especially as we think about adjusting our depth on the fly, what do we manage off of? Do we manage more off of temperature or do we manage more off of moisture? So here's a, a plot we did. This is a depth plot at the Lackner farm up in South Dakota. And what we did here in this depth plot, the agronomy team, they put in temperature loggers at inch and a half and at two and a half inches deep. Those are two of our depth treatments. And they log the temperature from the day of planting to the day of harvest. And here, let me show you that data. So this is a snippet of that from the day of planting on May 10th to the day of harvest, which is actually about May 17th, or I should say the, the day of emergence, which is actually May 17th. And what do you see? Well, the shallower planted seeds, or the shallower temperature probe, had more extreme swings, right? It was colder at night and it was warmer during the day. We were more buffered from that temperature at deeper depths. But when you look at the total heat unit accumulation, what you see is that because the average temp was about the same, 
the heat unit accumulation actually isn't that different. So it takes about 72 heat units in the soil, not in the air, 72 heat units in the soil to germinate the seed. And what do you see? May 17th, about when we emerged, we were only a half a day different. Only a half a day different in our total heat unit accumulation. Half a day difference in, in emergence timing. In general, our recommendation is going to be to manage depth off of moisture. The temperature is a lesser influence compared to moisture. So let's think about some furrow temperature principles. Number one, the data says lower temps equals lower uniformity. It's hard to put a hard limit on this. We all have kind of our own limits in our mind. But in general, lower temps equals lower uniformity. There is a critical time. So corn obviously takes up moisture slower than beans. The first 24 to 48 hours are what is critical for corn. Beans is a lot faster, 6 to 12 hours. So if you're planting late in the evening and it's getting real cold that night, watch it because the beans are going to take up all that moisture when it's chilly. Last, let's say you're planting 10 hybrids. Get yourself a saturated cold germ test. It'll cost you 200 bucks. It's a cheap way to gain some extra knowledge to inform the order of your planting. We actually didn't follow our own advice on one of our plots here in R&D this season. And one plot that we were really looking forward to the data from had terrible emergence after a cold snap. And what do you know, going back looking at the data, its saturated cold germ score was 85%. Compared to everything else, it was more in the upper 90s. So it's an easy way to separate the men from the boys. You know, saturated cold germ is the most extreme of the germ tests. You've got warm germ, regular cold germ. Saturated cold germ is the most extreme. Buy yourself a little bit of information, and, and you'll, be, you'll be wiser because of it. <clears throat> okay, I'm going to talk about residue, and then I'm going to hand it over to Doug. So let's dive into it. Residue, what does it do? What does it do if it's in the furrow? It carries disease. It also acts as a sponge. It acts as a sponge to pull moisture away from the seed. It acts as a sponge. It doesn't give moisture to the seed as easily as soil does. Now, let me show you a little demonstration. What we've got here is, is wet residue. We wet it down with a 20% water and added seeds for three days and compared that to soil. And what do we see? In the residue, we only gain 13% by weight. In the dirt, what do we gain? 45%. That residue is hanging tight onto that moisture. It didn't want to give any away. The dirt, on the other hand, it had got that seed all the way to start germination. Residue matters. Here's another one just to drive that one home. This is one I did in my basement a couple years ago. We've got residue next to the six seeds on the left. And I'd say about 25% of the seed was covered with residue. On the right, we've got nothing. And what do we see? Well, when we look at the germination, the time for germination to start, what we saw is two different scenarios. From the time it took from the first seed to the sixth seed in residue, we saw a 31-hour difference. No residue, 10 hours. It matters. It really matters. Now, let's talk about some questions here. What is a clean furrow level to shoot for? You know, everybody wants their box on the 2020 to be green. We switch from green to yellow at 95%. If you get in the upper 90s, it's going to be hard to, hard to have a measurable improvement by taking the last 1% of, of residue out of your furrow. In general, upper 90s is good. If you dip down to lower 90s, especially in the upper 80s, that's a lot of residue. That's going to have a significant impact. Now, let me share with you how we measure clean furrow. So that's, that's the measurement that we have of residue in the furrow. Now, the way this works is the, as the firmer is running through the furrow, every tenth of an inch, it's looking at a snapshot of the sidewall. And it's going to categorize that snapshot of the side sidewall as one of five things. Is it a void? In other words, is there a space there? Is it residue? Residue looks very different than, than a void or than dirt. Is it daylight? You know, of course we don't want daylight filtering down into the furrow. Is the moisture varying a lot? 
That's obviously something we want to avoid. That's going to affect this whole time question about seed germination and emergence. Or, of course, is it soil? So the way we calculate clean furrow is we take, all right, if I got 100 foot of furrow, if on 10% of it I identified it as residue, that's going to be a, a 90% clean furrow. So that's how that measurement works. Now, how do you decide? This is a study done by Jason Webster and his team at the PTI farm this past season. What they did is they did open furrow, they dropped seeds in, they also took residue, and they dropped residue in increasing amounts at 1%, 2%, 3%, all the way up to 35% residue next to those seeds. And they took it to harvest, they hand harvested, and this is what they saw. And I, when I first saw, saw this plot, I was like, wow, that's really good correlation. Well, of course, when they managed it that closely, they got really good correlation. For every 1% residue, they saw a 1.1 bushel per acre drop. So as you think about what it takes to get your furrow cleaner, I acknowledge, we'll talk about in just a minute, I acknowledge that there's situations where you've got to change your whole system to get that residue out of the furrow. If you've got incorporated residue, get that out of the furrow. You've got to change something bigger than just turning your, turning your sweeps up a little bit higher pressure. So what should I do if my clean furrow measurement is low? Well, definitely if we're down in the 89%, a couple of things to think about. Number one, is it surface residue? Obviously a lot easier to take care of. Get yourself some sweeps. Don't get fixed row cleaners. Get yourself floating row cleaners. Floating row cleaners are going to follow the contour of the ground. If you've got fixed row cleaners and you hit a bump, what's going to happen? You're going to plow. You're going to mess up your seed bed. If you hit a dip, what's going to happen? You're going to miss the residue. Get yourself floating row cleaners. Get yourself clean sweep. I can just about guarantee you, if I'd offer anybody in this room that has clean sweep, can I buy it back at the price you put? price you purchased it for, they'd say, no way. It is so convenient, so easy to put a little bit more downforce down, lift up the row cleaners in a lighter environment. You'll, uh, you'll love that, love that product. Okay, other things to consider. These are bigger picture things. Is it incorporated residue? If it's incorporated, the row cleaners aren't going to do much to help us out there. How much is it worth to change up your system to get rid of that incorporated residue? That's a question you have to ask yourself. I've seen situations where we're actually seeing roots. When you're going in next to a, next to, in a no-till field and you edge a little bit too close to an existing row, we'll pick up those roots. Is it a cover crop, right? It's hard to keep all that cover crop out of the furrow, and especially as more guys are getting into cover crops, that certainly we're gonna pay for that a little bit in terms of the residue, the experience that the seed has in the furrow. So I'm going to turn it over to Doug now, and he's going to talk about the last pillar of managing soil density. So Doug? Thanks, Dale. <clears throat> the other thing about emergence or germination is we have to have optimal soil density. So what's that? Well, how many of you have duels on tractors? How many of you have track tractors? Tracks on combines, tracks on planters? We've been managing, did grandpa manage density? Yeah, he did too, didn't he? My grandpa had duels on tractors. So we've been managing soil density for a lot of years. What do we do when we go out and we're doing primary tillage in the fall if we, if we run a ripper. Is that manage, trying to manage density? Yeah, we're trying to get that soil back if we've compacted it to a position that it produces at a higher rate, right? That's really what we're trying to do. So as we think about that with the planter, what are we doing to affect soil density with that planter pass? Well, my gauge wheels are going to put some pressure down, hopefully, right? That means I got depth. I'm going to firm the seed, and I'm going to close the furrow. Those three things all are impacting soil density. 
So uh, as we look at that in the furrow and we look at that seed, that sidewall firming comes from the amount of downforce down. In, in 10 years, I've done planter clinics all over the country on, on 2020s. And we have a downforce, and, and they ask, well, how much downforce should I run? What's the answer? It depends. No, it, it does depend. But the true answer is when you hit optimal soil density for that environment. That's really what we want to do. So is we, if we took soil and we put it under a microscope and we, we blew it up, would we want to see just 100% solid? Not really, no. That wouldn't be optimal soil density. Um, so here's kind of an animated picture where we have soil particle. We want air and we want water. We want to, there to be pore space between that soil. How do we accomplish that? How do we build pore space? Well, microbial activity, breaking residue down, the microbes and the fun, fungus in the soil, fungi in the soil, excrete uh, uh, stuff that binds soil particles together. And that creates aggregate structure. And the next thing you know, we've got pore space. That soil actually has cavities in it for air and water. So if we looked at the ideal composition of soil where we could have the highest microbial activity, the highest root growth and germination, it would consist like this. It would be 45 to 50 percent uh, mineral matter, which would be my clay, my silt, my sand. And it would be zero to five percent organic matter. We would all take five, right? Unless you got six. And we say, nah, I'll keep what I got. We get to inherit the organic matter. We don't get to decide necessarily, do we? So as we look through that, then the other side of the equation, we want 50% of that soil to be poor space. And in that poor space, if I could order it exactly as I'd want it, I'd want there to be uh, about uh, 20 to 30% air and 20 to 30% water at all times. If we could accomplish that, would we have good germination? Yeah, as long as we have temperatures, right? Would we have good root growth? Yes, absolutely. What happens if we get a two-inch rain? Well, that pore space becomes a higher percentage of water, doesn't it? It pushes some of that air out. And what happens if we hit this and we get three weeks of dry weather? Well, then some of that water evaporates. And gets pulled down by gravity, right? So if we could accomplish this, we're going to have optimal germination, optimal root growth, and highest level of microbial activity within that zone. How about this? What do you think the pore space is in this top surface of the soil? Higher? Than 50% or lower? Probably higher, huh? Is that poor space half air, half water, or is there a higher percentage of air there? A little bit more air, isn't there? So you can see this guy thought it was ready because there's a planter pass row unit right there. He probably said, you know what, I got this irrigation pivot over there. I'll turn that thing on as soon as I plant. I can make the water. So he went ahead and he planted. And then if you ask me, if you call me on the day that you're planting this and you say, Doug, how much downforce should I run? What would the answer be if I saw this? More. Right? More. I don't care what your number says. You need more. You see, you can be the only judge of what's behind that planter. And if we follow through, even if we got a pivot and we can add water, did it help? No, it didn't, did it? We got very poor emergence. We even got skips in that stand. You got very inconsistent emergence. So when we look at that example, we're going to add a lot more air to that equation. Anytime we do tillage, what are we doing? We're adding a lot more air to the equation. What's the risk? The risk is we're going to evaporate water. Maybe we want to do that. The other risk is we're... If that last pitcher stayed dry and we didn't have the ability to make water and roots develop into a bone dry environment with no water in that pore space, what's going to happen? 
those roots are going to just burn up, aren't they? It's going to create rootless corn. And we're going to decrease microbial activity. What happens when we go out there and we do tillage, let's just say, whether it's one inch deep or ten inches deep, well, let's just say spring tillage and I run three, four inches deep. And now let's say I get a three inch rain. What happens to that pore space that I just created a whole bunch of extra pore space? It's now air, a higher percentage air, and I get a three inch rain. That rain's going to fill that pore space. It's going to push the air out. How about if I work that, let's just say three, four inches deep, is that a looser soil? What will the water percolation rate be in that top four inches compared to that below it? Faster or slower? Faster, right. So what's going to happen is it's going to come down, it's going to hit the tighter, more denser soil profile, it's going to drive oxygen out of there, and we're going to create the same thing that Dale created with that sand when he put 7.5% moisture in it. It had enough moisture to germinate, it had enough temperature to germinate, but we waterlogged the environment, we drove the oxygen out of the soil, and, we had it, and, and the seed couldn't germinate. The seeds breathe in oxygen, they exhale CO2, so do the roots. If I don't have pore space, and if I don't have air in that pore space, along with water, it won't grow. So what's the risk? We're going to reduce the oxygen, and we're going to decrease microbial activity. A couple years ago, I was doing a root pit, and, and teaching out of a root pit, so I we dug it with a backhoe and they chipped all the dirt away and then, and then I slowly chipped dirt away and looking for roots and then following roots. Where are they going? How many of you done a root pit in your farm? A couple of you. It's a great detective way. It's a great way uh, to judge yourself. Roots are great judges. Don't be the judge of the roots. Let the roots be the judge of you and your management system. So when you go out in July or August and you dig a pit and tall corn, and those corn roots are massive and extensive and long, they're going to tell you every density change that's out there, that you created, that I created. So it's going to give you, an, it's going to give you a score on your fall tillage. It's going to give you a score on your pre spring tillage. It's going to give you a score on your planter pass. So here's one where we found a four-inch layer, and we found a number three crown root that ran horizontally on that four-inch layer. What did that crown root tell me? It told me that the density was different, didn't it? Because corn roots will take the path of least resistance. They don't want to go from a looser density to a tighter density. They'd rather avoid that if, can, if they can. And then here's a young corn plant where at V4 I was working a few years ago in a downforce tillage or downforce, uh, um, a downforce management plot. So we had a planter that we had delta force on. We had rows where we put, intentionally put excess downforce. So if you told me that, that 100 pounds was correct on that gauge wheel, we added a couple hundred additional pounds beyond what we believed would be correct. And so I went out there at V4 when this corn was at V4 and I'm digging the dirt away and I'm uh, cautiously looking for the roots and I found them. And guess what I noticed? The roots found the furrow. They also found the sidewalls because they said, I'm not going there. And that told me that that was poor density management. The next row over, we believed we applied the correct amount of downforce. And so I dug the roots to see if we were right. And I found that the roots didn't find the furrow. They didn't know where it was. They didn't know where the sidewall was because we had correct soil density management. So Dale talked about residue, temperature, and moisture. Another metric that the smart firmer gives us is uniform furrow. A uniform furrow is measuring voids, daylight, and moisture variation. So if I back up to that cloudy field, cultivated field there, do you think I'd maybe see a few voids in that one? Probably, right? Probably even maybe some daylight. They look like some pretty good clods, right? And so uh, uniform furrow is the metric that does a really good job of telling us what our soil density management was. If I have lots of moisture variation, is that a soil density issue? Sure is. You bet. So that's a good metric to be looking. We want to be at 95 or higher on uniform furrow. If you can start to get below that, 
you're going to run into issues. So let's look at the seed and everything outside of that, right? Not just think about the seed. We always think about moisture and temperature, oxygen, but let's think of how we're managing everything around in that micro environment. When we run that planter pass through, uh, that seed's going to come down the seed tube, and the very first thing, it's going to hit the furrow, and the very first thing that's going to touch it is a Keaton seed firmer. That's the first density management uh, process we're going to go through. Why would we run or run a, a Keaton seed firmer? Well, do you see that air pocket underneath that seed? Do I want that air pocket? I don't want too much air. I don't want too much water. I just want a, a balance of both, right? So I've got to squeeze that air out of there. I'm going to get good seed to soil contact. That Keaton seed former right there showed me, what it did is it took that seed and it guaranteed at least 50% of that seed is good against good soil density with water and air, right? And so... Some of you guys plant in heavier, stickier soils, right? And, and the Keaton seed firmer kind of struggles a little bit. And I've seen some of these. And so you say, man, it just don't work. And we, we create turkey legs with our Keaton seed firmers. They just won't work. And so last year, last spring, our, our engineering team designed a low-stick Keaton seed firmer. And they went up in in Minnesota, into areas that they had really heavy, sticky soil that they always struggle with buildup. And they ran that low-stick Keaton material right alongside on the same planter that they were building turkey legs. And it worked. When they had turkey legs uh, right beside that on the right, the rows right beside it with low-stick Keaton didn't have any buildup at all. So I'm going to, the, the low-stick Keaton is available for sale this year. I'm going to pass this around just because we don't have many of them and, and, and they're coming, but it uh, gives you a chance to kind of take a look at it. Okay, so there's the low stick Keaton. The next thing we're going to do, does that work with the furrow jet? Yes, we have a low stick designed for furrow jet as well. So the next thing after we firm the seed is we got to firm the sidewalls. We want to put enough weight on the sidewalls that we manage soil density. That's the correct weight. <clears throat> In this environment, does that look like enough or too much or not enough? I heard not enough and I heard too much. Right? It looks a little wet, doesn't it? For my taste. Okay, so is that correct? Well, <clears throat> if we compact the soil, the opposite happens. We now take that soil and we squeeze out the pore space. And we collapse that macro pore structure. And now we have too much solid. Not enough air, not enough water. And so now we're going to struggle. And the risk here is we're going to reduce oxygen, we're going to reduce water, and we're going to decrease microbial activity. So let's think about the sidewalls. As we take a look at the row unit, what is the things that's requiring weight? We're trying to do a task out there. And so we've got row cleaners on the front that that's going to all require a certain amount of weight to do its job. We've got a double disc opener that we want to get our seeds to depth. That's got to take a little bit of weight to do its job. That's going to vary with speed, isn't it? Say I go two inches deep. If I go 2.3 mile per hour instead of 2 mile per hour, it's going to require more downforce to keep in the soil. And then I got my closing wheel on the back, it's also going to require a, a certain amount of force to manage soil density to the level that I want. Now we look at above that example, and this is all the available weight, right? We've got the seed, the insecticide, the weight of the row unit, and the applied weight. And so everything that's left over, when I add up the total weight up top and I, and I subtract the weight required to do what I'm trying to do, the leftover weight's carried right there. And that's my sidewall downforce. I don't want that necessarily to be at zero or three or four pounds. I want it to be enough that I can get my pore space back down to 50% of the equation, ideally with half air, half water in that pore space. So when it comes to downforce, the 2020 has become a very valuable tool in managing that. Um, 
when in 2008, when we come out with the 2020, I really believed that singulation and spacing were going to be huge deals. Like, that's what I was thinking. Man, we're going to be able to manage our meters and see if they're performing poorly. And I soon learned that downforce was really the meat and potatoes of that system. So in 2008, we went to the very first field that we planted on the Wiegand farm. I was in the tractor with Uncle Mark. He was driving, planting, and I was just the, 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 the tag along. And we made each pass, and we decided within a few rounds that notch number three on the heavy-duty springs of applied pressure was the correct downforce. Because that's the one that kept us in the ground and kept us from losing ground contact, right? And so we planted every pass, and that's the map on the back end. And as we looked at that map, we thought, you know what? There's spots of this field we were carrying over 200 pounds extra. And there was also spots in this field that we hit the bullseye. And we couldn't make an adjustment because we just had to find the right range, right? So in 2013, the engineers designed a system called Delta Force. And that system now put a load pin on every row a processor on every row, and a hydraulic cylinder on every row. And that processor took a reading every five milliseconds of time from the load pin reading. That's about every half inch of movement. And immediately after doing that, it would send the command to the cylinder to say, adjust, I need more, I need less. So in 2013, we put that on our planner and a row by row map, did we hit the correct target? Yeah, we did. Now, that doesn't mean that it was the right soil density management. That depends on the manager, right? But whatever setting I put on there, we hit it. The system drove it home. So as we look then at the final thing that we're after, and that's closing, we're going to close that furrow and try to achieve the proper soil density. When I go out and we plant, what do we do on the back end? We're digging to see if we have seed, right? at what depth it is, is it in moisture, is all these things. The next thing I'm doing is I'm just walking. And when I look at this picture, uh, if you look at the top, that's from the top view. It looks like it's closed, doesn't it? You say, well, yeah, man, we're doing a good job here. But if we dig a cross section and we look at that, what we realize is, boy, we got some air pockets in here. Is that going to lend itself well to germination and emergence and root growth? No. Poor soil density, right? So then the next thing we dig when we make an adjustment, now we're going we're gonna to increase the downforce. We go back, we start digging seed, and we find good soil density around there. We have to have enough force to get that macro pore structure back down to that 50% air and water to the proper soil density. So as we, as we look at that then, that's really our objective with the seed firmer, with the downforce management, and with the closing on that furrow. And then, you know, I asked you, do you dig a root pit? A root pit gives you a, a, a really good score on what you need to do. It tells you about everything you're doing. Managing soil density equals dollars. If I can hit that density management sweet spot, I'm going to have consistent emerg or germination, consistent emergence, and consistent plant development. Any questions? Yes. When you were low stick seed firmer, it looked like there was kind of a joint almost molded into it, which is obviously different. Can you explain that a little bit? Or why would somebody, is there significant price difference, or why would you just go that way? I mean, I, I read yeah. Really yeah. You want to answer yes, that, Dale? That, where's that low stick firmer, just so I can point to it? You yeah, the question was on the low stick firmer, he noticed there was a joint difference. Yeah, like so a this different... doesn't look like a traditional firmer. Right. Um, so. The thing we're trying to avoid, you know, we've added a lot of material here in the back to make sure this is all low stick material. Because if we just put it down here, the turkey lake would start up here and it eventually cover the whole back. So because we've made it stiffer, we've had to prevent failures when you back up because it happens where you back up over firmer. So what we've got here is, if you imagine this held like that, this can flex it's maybe a little bit hard to see, but there's hooks down here on the bottom, and there's pegs on the part that's flexing, and those pegs prevent the firmer from getting bent under. So it's designed to actually plow 
if you back up and your planner's not quite all the way raised. Um, so does that answer your question? Okay. And there's, there's increased down pressure over the original aircraft. Yeah, so we, right now with the Keaton, we're at uh, 1.7 pounds, something like that. I think this, actually the designer's back there. What are we at, Reed? About three and a half pounds. Yep. Yep. So pricing hasn't yet been set on these. Um, hopefully in the next week or two, they'll be on the order board. But, uh, but yeah. What else? What do we got time for question-wise? Who's keeping us honest on time here? A couple more okay. questions. Question was, do we have any problems with smart firmers picking up dirt? Uh, the answer would be in those sticky soils, yeah. And so I'll, I'll let Dale speak on that as well. Yeah, being the, yeah being question the about smart firmer and sticky soils. So in general, if you have trouble running a Keaton in your soil and balling up, you're probably going to have issue with a smart firmer balling up. Now, we acknowledge that, especially those folks who are on the, you know, from Fargo, they've got real sticky soils up there, northwest Iowa. Um, we are working on a version that will be beta testing this spring that's a low stick smart firmer. Um, so if you're interested in participating in that, you, you know you got real sticky soils, talk to your dealer and they can get you on the list for, for that. So there'll be two versions of, of Smart Firmer. Yeah? Uh, with that sticky soil situation taking effect and with your technology, is there a way of detecting that in the cab of the tractor uh, on your unit uh, so that obviously all we notice is that right. like falling up? Yep, yep, good question. Good question. So question was, hey, if I got sticky soils and I start balling up, does Smart Firmer know it or does it just keep charging along? Well, the way it works is if we see the lens start to get covered, immediately we'll throw up a pop-up and it'll say, hey, it's starting to ball up. You can say, okay, and clean it off. But also what we'll do is we will quarantine, if you will, we'll quarantine the results from that Smart Firmer. So Let's say you're controlling your population by organic matter. That firmer will no longer have its numbers put into the calculation for the, organ for the overall organic matter uh, reading from your planner that you're using to control your population. So when we're actually controlling, we'll quarantine those numbers. We'll give you a pop-up if we see that it's, you know, basically your reading stopped changing when it balls up, and that's, that's how we manage that. Questions, should soybean furrow be as clean as the, for, as the corn? <clears throat> Residue is going gonna, is gonna to insulate. It's going to create toxins in the soil when it breaks down. And it's going to um, hold on to moisture tighter than the seed can get. I think that applies to all seed. So my answer would be absolutely. I, th I think any seed... Uh, that's wanting oxygen and moisture to germinate, if I have residue against that, you're going to deter or vary the consistency. Well, great. Well, hey, thank you, guys. You're going to be going over to the exhibit hall next. Josh is going to lead you. If you have any quick questions you want to come up and ask us, feel free. So thanks for your attention. Thanks, guys.